So the results are in and it's a landslide Labour victory here in the United Kingdom. Welcome back to our special coverage of the UK general election here on Al Arabiya English. We've been bringing you all the speculation throughout the week, the political insight and analysis, and now we have the results. So let's get down to it and find out what our special political experts today think about what's happened here. First, to kick things off, who better to speak to than the former Speaker of the House of Commons, John Burko. John, great to see you. Hello, good to see you. Any big surprises for you in any of this? No, I wouldn't say there has been a big surprise. I certainly anticipated and predicted to all of my friends that the Conservatives would be slaughtered. I never bought the idea that there would be a heavy narrowing of the gap and that it would be nip and tuck as to whether Keir Starmer and the Labour Party were able to get a majority. It always seemed to me that it was pretty much dialed in that Labour would win and win big. So there's no surprise there. I suppose the only surprise was that there were a number of individual contests that went against expectations. So, for example, a lot of people thought that Jeremy Hunt would lose his seat, but he managed to keep it. And not that many people thought that Liz Truss would lose hers, and she did. Or there was a, obviously a compelling reason as to why people wanted to turn out against her. And on the Labour side, there were a couple of unexpected defeats. But in terms of the big picture, there is no surprise to me at all. The Conservatives were doomed by a combination of Nigel Farage's Reform Party fighting the election and fighting them in every seat on the one hand, and the impact of the Liberal Democrats and tactical okay. voting in the blue wall. So there was almost, if you will, against the Tories, a mm. pincer movement. And the consequence of that was bound to be bad. I'll come back Rishi. to you on Nigel Farage and the Reform Party particularly as well. Uh, but I do want to talk about the timing of this election because Rishi Sunak said, I'll call an election at some point in the second half of this year. And then he called one at the earliest possible time in the second half, early July. Do you think it was a, a, a misstep strategically? Yes, I think it was a mistake. But I don't think it was a mistake that had the most enormous impact on the result. I think if he had waited, and it may well be that there was bad news down the pipeline, the result could have been just as poor. So why does it matter? I suppose it matters, Rosanna, as much psychologically as anything. It's one thing to call an election at a time which surprises your opponents. It's another to call an election at a time which surprises, alarms, nay, terrifies your own side. That was his first big mistake. And I have no personal animus towards Rishi Sunak, but it is hard to imagine a series of blunders more comprehensive than that over which he presided and for which he must take responsibility from the start of the campaign to its end. It well, was a comprehensive disaster in conception and execution alike. I mean, the campaign itself, he called it while standing in a thundering rain shower outside Downing Street. And as you say, there have been some missteps along the way, as there were with other parties too. But in terms of his time as Prime Minister, how do you think Rishi Sunak will be remembered? I'm sorry to say that I think he will be remembered extremely negatively. He started with some goodwill, both in his own party and beyond, because people could see what an appalling, unqualified mess Liz Truss had made of matters, the effect of which was sharply to increase people's housing costs to the tune of thousands of pounds a year. So when Rishi Sunak started, I think there were people who thought, well, give the guy a chance. He seems to have a sensible head. He's got quite a lot of experience as a senior minister. He was by no means universally derided for his role during COVID in terms of eat out, help out. There are criticisms, sure, but the furlough scheme was on the whole a popular scheme and a necessary scheme. So I think there were people who thought, well, there's something there with which his party and his government can work. And of course, if you remember when he tried to change the Northern Ireland Protocol, the so-called Windsor framework, and did so, he stood up to Boris Johnson and those who threatened to vote it down. And that was actually rather an auspicious start. Unfortunately, thereafter, virtually everything that could go wrong did go wrong. And I think the reason why in the end people will have a very negative opinion of him is that he set himself some limited targets, missed a number of them, and showed 
a complete lack of political acumen and dexterity in virtually everything that he said and did. He may well have been an efficient and competent, successful merchant banker, but the skill set required for the effective administration mm -hmm. of public affairs as a politician, and particularly as prime minister, is very different. And candidly, he just doesn't have that skill set. Some observations today that his departure speech from Downing Street was actually quite graceful um, and quite respectful, and some saying if he'd led the campaign in that manner, it may have been more successful. Do you agree? I do. I do. I thought that the speech that he delivered today was gracious. I thought it was a series of well-chosen words, and it was delivered in a statesmanlike fashion. But I'm afraid it came after the result, not in the run-up to it. So does that enable him to salvage something in terms of personal pride and perhaps in the history books reputationally? Perhaps, but I think it's not a matter of crumbs of comfort, but a crumb singular. Do you think Keir Starmer, who is now Prime Minister, he says he's he going said, to bring sort of back good-natured politics to this country and kind of lead with a bit of heart. Do you think he'll be able to deliver on that? I think he'll try. I think he's sincere. I think he means business. I think he would like a different tone to our politics. It is also dependent upon all parts of the machine agreeing with that and resolving to deliver it. What do I mean by that? Well, I remember in the past that when David Cameron became Prime Minister, he said he would he said, like a more respectful and conversational tone at Prime Minister's questions. Yarboo politics was rather unattractive, indeed almost repugnant to lots of voters, and he would eschew it. Well, that didn't last very long. He ended up calling Ed Miliband despicable, which is not quite consistent with the ambition he set himself. Similarly, Ed Miliband had said that he didn't like a very abrasive style in the chamber and he didn't like a braying noise to be made behind him when he got up to speak. Well, the truth is that the parties and their whips very often do rather like that mm. and people can become institutionalised, even new members, quite quickly to a very rambunctious culture. So I think the answer to your question is, if Keir Starmer insists that his writ will run. Mm. This is the tone we will take. This is how I expect my parliamentary colleagues to conduct themselves in question time series and debates. It will happen. Mm. If he doesn't insist on it, it won't. Interesting, because you have that unique experience and expertise of being in that chamber day after day and seeing the way that these politicians are behaving. Let's talk some more then about Nigel Farage, because he's become a disruptive force, or he has been for several years, but now he finally has a seat as a Member of Parliament. What can he actually achieve? We have an international we have an in audience, and I'd like them to understand how disruptive he could be in the chamber, in the House of Commons, and what he could actually get enacted if he wanted. He won't be able to get anything enacted, as you put it, if by that you mean the formal concept of enactment in Parliament, namely legislation. He won't be able to do that because he's likely to have four members of Parliament or at most five. He will in that sense be in a tiny minority. He's not going to have all that many biddable partners in terms of building coalitions in the House of Commons. He's not going to build coalitions with the Labour Party and he's not going to be able to get the numbers to create legislation. I think his capacity to disrupt is quite considerable. He will have to accept that in question time sessions he can put a question, but the Prime Minister or other minister will respond. And under our system, that response will be judged by the Speaker to be final. So it will not be possible for him continually to say, ya boo. He will just have to accept he's asked a question, the answer comes, and that's the end of it. I think what he'll do is use every opportunity to persuade the Speaker to accept from him urgent questions, capital U, capital Q, mm. for which there is provision in the House of Commons system, to raise matters that the government doesn't want debated in the House, but which Nigel Farage and his party does. I think he'll do that. I think he'll probably seek emergency debates. There's a standing order that allows for the pursuit of emergency debates on issues that arise. Again, when the government's not providing the debate, if Farage thinks something matters, I think he'll try to get those issues aired in the chamber. My overall sense is that what he'll do is pursue a twin-track strategy of 
parliamentary pressure and public mm -hmm. pronouncement through press conferences, public meetings and social media activity. Mm. Will it work? Well, it will work in the sense he'll stir it, he'll mix it, he'll try to cause the government trouble, he will increase very substantially his own profile. I suppose the unanswered question is this, when people see and hear more of him, will they like him more or like him less? Mm. The jury is out. Well, the jury is out, but certain Conservative peers, the party of which you were once a member, have... We've well, spoken in a to... very inglorious past, Rosanna, I think it's well, somewhat tendentious and unkind It was a fairly to long me time, when I left Mr Burko. Party, <laughs> to be precise, 15 years. Order, order in the days. chamber, Mr Burko, you cannot rewrite the history. You were a member of I the was, Conservative Party. until and, 15 years and ago. And some of your peers, uh, one we spoke to yesterday, Lord Marlon, suggested that it had been a mistake of the Conservative Party to not partner up with Nigel Farage in this campaign. Do you agree with that? No, I don't agree with that. I don't agree with that. I can understand that the Conservative Party now has got a real challenge because on the one hand, if it is to pitch successfully for centre ground support, mm. it needs a moderate and a constructive and a reasonable as distinct from an outlandish and extreme position. On the other hand, if it is to win back support from people who went to reform, it has to tap into those concerns, for example, on immigration. Mm. But do I think that it would have been a sensible thing for it to forge an agreement with Nigel Farage before the election? I'm not sure that it would have been sensible, but I don't think it would have happened. I don't think there was the appetite at that stage for it to happen. So, with the very greatest respect to the noble lord, the Lord Marland, who's never himself been part of the elected mm. component of the British legislature, he's being wise, brackets, sort of, and not very, close brackets, after the event. Well, let's move on to your more recent history then, which was, of course, with the Labour Party up until about two years ago, if my memory serves me correctly. Uh, Keir Starmer, the leader of the current Labour government, we can say that today, he has promised with regards to Brexit, which, of course, is a massive policy point for a lot of people in this country, almost half more polling these days, uh, that we're unlikely to see Britain reunified within the European Union within his lifetime, was his recent words. Do you think he's misstepping there? No, I completely understand why Keir Starmer wanted to clear the decks so far as the construction of a manifesto and the organisation of an election campaign was concerned. I think he thought, he... rightly, that if the Brexit issue dominated and if he was accused of plotting to reverse it and having a mischievous plan through front door or back to get us back into the European Union, that would alienate many of the voters whose support he needed to attract. So I think he was right to steer clear of the issue. However, he hasn't steered clear of it altogether. He's simply said, we're not planning to rejoin the European Union and we're not planning to rejoin the customs union. We're not planning to rejoin the single market. I think he does think that the deal that we have with the European Union is poor and in time and with good negotiating skills and an atmosphere of mutual goodwill within the EU, that deal could be improved. So would I cavil at his position or say that I think it's wrong-headed? No, I think he knows the reality that the European Union is our closest proximate trade bloc mm -hmm. and it's our closest proximate power bloc. We have to have a good relationship with it, but it doesn't mean being a member of it. Well, while talking about power and relationships, there's a US election later this year. We don't know whether we'll see Biden or Trump or maybe another Democrat in the White House. We now know we've got Keir Starmer here, though. So what do you think he's going to be like on a world stage dealing with the US president? I think Keir Starmer will do extremely well. I think he's very measured. He's very calm. He's very thoughtful. And I think in a way that is very fitting for somebody who has just attained his high office, he's very respectful of others with whom he knows he has to deal. So what I'm really saying to you, if you want it, and your viewers want it in a sentence, is I think that Keir Starmer understands that he has to practice real politique. He has to deal with the world, not as he wishes it to be, but as it is. And so in answer to your question, whether it be Joe Biden, 
in the White House, and if I were in the United States, I would most certainly vote for Biden rather than Trump, or Donald Trump, that's a matter for the American people. Keir Starmer has to be sufficiently agile, politically oh. dexterous and savvy to contend with whatever emerges on the other side of the pond, just as there may be leaders of other countries whom he wouldn't choose if it were up to him to do so. But he's got to look at who's in office and he's got to try to forge, and having forged, to sustain and nurture good relationships. Now, I think the fact that he has got experience mm -hmm. of running a public agency, namely the Crown Prosecution Service, is a start. And I think the fact that he has got a sense of purpose, but also a relatively emollient manner, mm. is a good thing. So I think he starts with lots of positives. And remember, a prime minister is never in a more powerful position than at the start. Mm -hmm. In other parts of the world, in the United States, in Europe, in the Middle East, whatever leaders think of him, and some will probably think extremely highly of him, and there may be others who don't, just as he has to deal with them, they have to deal with him. And he has the enormous ballast mm. of a supermajority. Just finally, John, I know this might seem a bit perverse, strange even as a question, but for some reason, no matter what we talk about during this election campaign as it's now ending, the words Boris Johnson still seem to enter conversation. He was wheeled out by the Conservatives quite late in the campaign. We're an international network. There's a lot of international interest in Boris Johnson still as a person. Do you think there's any way he can re rehabilitate his public political image in the UK? I think it is staggeringly unlikely that he will rehabilitate himself politically. I don't think that he's shown the slightest recognition of past misdemeanor. He doesn't think that he was wrong. He thinks there was a conspiracy to drive him out. Now, if he wants to row back on all of that and say that he's had a Damascene conversion and he realizes just how foolish he was, well, I suppose anything is possible and that old expression, nothing is forever. And, and what's the theological definition of eternity? Never say never. Do I think he'll make a political comeback in the UK? I don't. I did, in the course of my time as Speaker, deal with four Prime Ministers, Gordon Brown, David Cameron, Theresa May and Boris Johnson. It is only fair to say, which I do in my characteristically understated fashion, that Boris Johnson was by a country mile the worst. He was dishonest, unprincipled, narcissistic, demonstrating only a nodding acquaintance with the truth, perhaps, in a leap year, and also, I thought, the most inarticulate Prime Minister that I've ever had the misfortune to encounter. Now, apart from that, he might be all right. John, we'll leave it there. There's little more to say. John Burke, former Speaker of the House of Commons, it's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. So throughout our special coverage this week of the UK general election here on Al Arabiya English, we've been talking a lot about polls, especially in the days leading up to the voting, because we want to get a sense of the way people might want to vote. Now, there's varying ideas about how accurate polls actually are and how much we should rely on them. Now that we've got the result, indeed a landslide for Labour, as was predicted by many, we can actually look back and see how accurate some of those polls were. Joining me in the studio to discuss more of this is Joe Twyman, co-founder and director of Delta Poll. And Joe, I'll start very simply with that. How accurate were the polls this year? Pretty good. Not brilliant, but, uh, but a, a strong performance. And certainly in terms of the overall story, spot on. It was indeed the large Labour majority that the polls have been predicting, not just recently, not just throughout the campaign, but actually in some cases for years. Indeed, and that landslide was huge uh, for Labour, but has led to some discussions about electoral reform in this country. The discussions have been around for a long time, but we have an international audience. Give, us, give them a sense, if you wouldn't mind, of just how strange this election is in the way that Labour have won. I think a good way to look at it is in terms of vote efficiency. Now, what does that mean for people that don't speak RoboGeek? It means the number <laughs> of votes that you need in order to win a seat. 
For Labour, that figure was 23,500. For every 23,500 votes they won nationally, they got a seat. Obviously, it's more complicated than that because it's actually 650 individual constituencies. But compare that to Reform UK, a success story, certainly in terms of share of the vote, but only picking up four votes, uh, sorry, only picking up four seats. They needed a million votes for every seat that they, uh, that they won. And so those are the two extremes, showing how Labour has a very broad appeal, but it's quite narrow. Whereas, uh, whereas reform really did uh, pile up votes, but came second in a lot of areas and didn't get across the line very often at all. Indeed, and you can imagine that reform will be one of those parties that's talking more and more about proportional representation and the need for that or their desire for it in coming years. Were there any surprises for you? Reform was a big story leading into this election. People wondered if they were going to get no seats at all or many more seats. They've ended up with four, potentially five. Um, was that a surprise to you? The big surprise to me was not just reform's performance in terms, of, in terms of seats, but actually the performance of all of the parties away from the Conservative and Labour, the two main parties. And so when you look at the Conservative and Labour combined share of the vote, that was 56%. Now that may sound like quite a lot, but actually by historical standards in this country, it's the lowest it's ever been in modern times and by some distance. The most recent, uh, the next biggest figure was 61% back in 2010. So a long way behind even, uh, even that. And so when you look at how that works out in terms of seats, it meant that we had four seats for Plaid Cymru, the Welsh nationalists, uh, four seats for the Green Party, significantly increasing their presence, four uh, seats for reform. All of these are anti-mainstream politics parties and it was their performance that really surprised me. So would you in that sense define this election campaign compared to others in the UK as a protest um, election? People would just wanted anything but the sitting Conservative government. That's certainly one way to look at it and in many of those 650 individual contests that was very much the theme that came through in the results. This was about an anti-Tory anti-conservative position and Labour benefited from that massively as did the Lib Dems, as did the other parties. It was the Conservatives that were really hit on all sides which is why their performance was not just low, it was historically low. Now in terms of Labour and their win, uh, the, the proportional representation side of it perhaps not stacking up to the first past the post system that they, they did win on, how comfortable can they feel? They have got an extraordinary amount of seats. Yes, they have a, a very large majority, but actually in terms of share of the vote, it's relatively small. And in terms of the number of votes, it's actually fewer votes than they achieved at the previous two general elections, both of which they lost. And I think longer term, that may raise questions about the legitimacy of their, uh, of their position. But ultimately, it's about the number of seats you have in Parliament, and they will have a lot and the power that that provides them certainly for the first let's say 100 days will be enormous. Obviously any honeymoon period won't last forever and the uh, many of the problems that this country has faced over the last few years will still be there for Labour but I think they're in a very strong position to, uh, to deliver at least in the short to medium term. And one of the threats that will be on their horizon for the idea of a second term in the next general election, 2029, looking ahead, is the continued rise of somebody like Nigel Farage. How much do you think we're going to continue to see these big personality figures, some would say populist figures, here in UK politics? Well, that's a really interesting question and one to which we simply don't have the answer. The real question for reform now is can they build on this, ref on this momentum? They have been the success story, not just of the campaign, but really of the entire year. They've surged up in the polls, particularly since Nigel Farage came back as both a candidate and party leader. But will they top out or will they be able to build on that, uh, on that momentum? It will take a lot of professionalism, not just of the party, but of the candidates and of their spokespeople. They cannot simply be a one-person show with hangers-on. Uh, and so Nigel Farage has done a good job so far. The question is, can he do what's required to take things to the next level?
The answer is we don't know. Just finally, Joe, and I appreciate you've had a very long week of talking to media like us and talking about polls, so I don't want to send you into an existentialist spin, but one conversation we've had throughout the week is whether there are too many polls. Um, you've certain, spoken to certain people who said there used to be sort of five polling companies in the UK and now there are lots. Do you think there are too many? Uh, well, it depends what you mean by too many. I think, uh, I think reputable, good quality, representative research is of benefit fit to the democratic process and indeed that's why people like Vladimir Putin ban such work but having said that I think that polling that is in effect campaigns and campaigners masquerading as uh, masquerading as something else that's not helpful and so we had one poll uh, for instance during this campaign that showed reform ahead of the Conservatives by some distance in the final poll it didn't turn out like that, but it's recognition of, uh, of the fact that these things can sometimes be used to produce particular results and push a particular agenda, and I don't think that's a good thing. Really interesting stuff. Joe Twyman of Delta Poll, thank you. Thank you. Well, let's wrap up our special election coverage here on Al Arabiya English. The UK decides in characteristic fashion, as we've been doing for the last couple of shows, with a lovely informed panel here in the studio to give you a sense inside the politics and maybe even the, indeed some of the humour of this election so far. I'm pleased to say uh, joining me here in the studio is Gitto Harry, former Director of Communications, to Conservative Prime Minister Boris Johnson, Alicia Fitzgerald, political correspondent, and Jonathan Haslam, former Director of communications to Conservative Prime Minister John Major. All three of you, thank you very much. Uh, Gitto, as you're nearest to me, I'm going to get straight in there and ask you about the timing of this election, because do you think it was a misstep? It was a bad call. It was a really bad call. I mean, A, because it could not have ended far worse than, than it did, and B, you can see how over the next few months things could have got a little bit better. They could have got better in terms of economic news, they could have been better prepared, and you would not have had a Prime Minister whose main pitch was that he may not be flashy and charismatic, but he was a professional, wouldn't have seen him launching in pouring rain. And there was one moment, I must say earlier today, when I thought, I hope somebody's number 10 has noticed that it's actually pouring down with rain today as well, and they've at least given him an umbrella this time. You see, that's why it's interesting to have all three of you in the studio today, because you you monitor these things from the sense of uh, public relations and journalism and work out whether it's good messaging or not, which is so much of what politics is about. Alicia, you remember when Sunak was standing there, as Gitta was saying, in the pouring rain, announcing the start of the election. What were your thoughts? I mean, it was just terrible imagery, and I think everyone agreed with that across the board. To have a Prime Minister who had majorly lost the confidence of the country, and that was clear before the election was even called, standing in the pouring rain with no umbrella, whilst a protester stood outside the gates of Downing Street playing Labour's 97 victory music, things can only get better. I mean, it's a recipe for disaster, and as we saw the following day all of the newspaper front pages had that image of him looking absolutely sodden and looking really quite miserable and clearly it just set the election off on that on that messaging for the for the Tories. And indeed things only got worse uh, to the extent we had a landslide victory last night Jonathan uh, from Labour. I mean were you watching the Sunak election campaign uh, with a PR mindset? Were you thinking how you would have handled it differently? Uh, well, doing anything better would have been the answer because everything went wrong. It was a complete misstep right from the outset. Uh, as Alicia and Guto said, the way it which was launched was appalling. Uh, it uh, launched a thousand memes on social media, which is so important. My particular favourite is him going through the door, having made his announcement, and you have a Wilhelm scream come afterwards. But everything that went wrong there was just symptomatic of a very, very badly planned campaign. And one only has to look at D-Day, for example, just to see for three hours and missing the opportunity to go and be there with Biden and Macron and Schultz and say, I am a world leader, is just a horrible missed opportunity. So it was quite odd from the start. And we've been talking about you know, why it is that he went there. So what went wrong? Did he assume that he wasn't going to get any flights to Rwanda? Did he have no idea what was going to come from reform? There are so many unanswered questions yet, and we're going to be having great fun 
you know, doing the uh, post-mortem on this one for, I think, quite a long time, Rosanna. Well, we are getting a taster of that in the studio right this moment. In terms of the gracefulness of his exit today, standing outside Downing Street and giving a speech, it's a very important moment for a lot of departing Prime Ministers, setting them up for what's going to come next. I remember uh, Percy Theresa May leaving and um, actually crying standing at the podium. That will stay with me. It was a real sort of human moment. Uh, how do you think he handled the exit today, Sunak, Gitto? Um, great dignity. He got the tone right, the humility, the apology was sort of touching. Um, he was right to defend his record in doing some of the heavy lifting, not only during the pandemic, but recently in getting interest rates down to a level where, you know, the happy first quarter of a Labour government is almost certainly going to see a cut in interest rates. But that's down to his heavy lifting, not theirs. But I think most touching, and it's one of the things that is timeless and universal about the UK, was a reminder that it's still quite a big deal to have a Prime Minister uh, who, as he told us in the campaign, has quite deep uh, religious faith and Hindu faith, talking about his pride in seeing his Hindu daughters light Diwali candles outside number 10 and his parents having come here and him ending up being Prime Minister. It's still quite a big deal that he, that he did the job at all, even though it ended, you know, pretty badly. Jonathan, I want to ask how, how you think about advising as a communications director a Prime Minister to leave? I mean, what are the thoughts that go through your head? What are you trying to... What, what kind of messages are you trying to get to the public? You want to be really human about it. Do you want to congratulate your opponent and make those points that actually we are lucky to have a democracy where this change of power can handle, be handled very, very sensitively and quickly? And I thought that uh, Jeremy Hunt did a really good job in his own respect of making those important points about people leaving and a power handover is going to be quite seamless. But from Sunak's point of view, um, obviously he's exhausted uh, and that showed. But to give those human elements just says, OK, I might have been Prime Minister, might have had all the trappings of power, but I am an individual, I've got my family to look after as well. And I think people will respect that and I'm sure that that will be respected by Keir Starmer. They had a conversation, we understand, in the early hours of the morning, and that was quite amicable. So you know, there are times when politics isn't just a punch in the face. It actually can be about human beings honestly believing that they're doing the right thing. Talking about exhausted, you all must be by the end of this week, especially you, Alicia, because as a reporter, you've been out there a lot, uh, day and night, especially last night, watching the kind of the results come in. There were some graceful exits, some less grateful. Were there any that stood out to you? I mean, so I was actually at Penny Morden's constituency count, and she is quite significant because she was long mooted to be one of the front runners to succeed Rishi Sunak as the next Conservative Party leader, and she lost her seat. It was very close to Labour, but you could see in her speech it was really emotional she seemed quite shocked that she had actually lost but it was actually quite a nice and dignified speech but the same has not been said for for all of the conservative mps who lost their seats I think jacob reese mogg his was a bit of a shocker when he lost his most people don't most expect him to lose it and he definitely didn't keep his cards close to his chest with with his feelings he said that the conservatives are dropping like flies and that they've only got themselves to blame so there was a lot of tension i'd say between some of the tory the big players the big beasts who did lose their seats um very much shunting the blame to rishi sunak and saying that the reason that they had lost was because of his leadership so i think it'll be interesting to see how this all pans out of the, over the next few weeks and also who the next front runners are to replace rishi sunak when he does stand down as leader. Yeah, the, the, best, the, the, yeah. the best leaving speech was by Liz, Liz Truss. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was going to say there's great relief, though in terms of a moment of drama, we've all been deprived of what she yes. might have said. Yeah. But I was literally looking at the screen saying, walk away, walk <laughs> away, do not pause, yes. you know, step away from that microphone. Oh, yes, because um, the, the mimics and the imitators would have had enormous fun with that yeah. and still will. I mean, it's absolutely going to happen. Jen Ravens has got a career for life out of this one. There you go. Look, somebody we must, of course, touch on and talk about is Nigel Farage, which is the source of many of the woes of the Conservative Party, split that right vote uh, this time around in the election this afternoon uh, after gaining a seat gaining along with a couple with of his colleagues in the House of Commons. He held a rally, a press rally. I'll come to you, Alyssa, because I know you were there, but Gitter, in terms of the coverage that Nigel Farage and the Reform Party had coming into come this election and during the election, do you think it was disproportionate? Uh, he's amazing at creating a noise and creating a stir. And unfortunately, this is one where the Conservative campaign never got on top of it. 
And the closest we saw to that was the one intervention by my former boss, Boris Johnson, where you could just see in five minutes, he made Nigel Farage look ludicrous. Imagine if you'd have had five weeks of Boris. Well, Nigel Farage would have ne never taken off. So whatever else people think of him, we miss that ability to take out an opponent. And we miss the sort of humor, and I think the sort of raw charisma that we got a flash of, because we didn't get that. It wasn't a boring campaign, but there were two guys who never really inspired any of us, I don't think. Why was Boris wheeled out, I'm gonna use the term wheeled out, so late then by the Conservatives? Or was it, was it a case of trying to get him to come out in support of Sunak? Absolutely, and he wasn't particularly keen to do it because Sunak may have rung Keir Starmer this morning, but when he decided to resign and precipitate the toppling of Boris, he did not ring him, nor even text him. We discovered it, you know, in public. And so, a bit of bad blood there, but okay. I think Boris felt, in the end, you know, you cannot run on the field in the last five minutes of a game when somebody else has picked the team and somebody else has set the sort of game plan and expect to make a real impact. So it was a tokenistic thing to just to show, you know, supporters that he wasn't going to let it all pass by and what they were missing. But there was no way he was going to be able to help somebody else's campaign, somebody else's pitch. Somebody else was getting on. advice from Gareth Southgate on when it is that you bring on star players at the last point of a game, <laughs> which is absolutely too late. And I do agree with Gitto. I mean, Boris says many things. I'm not his greatest fan, but he's a star attraction. Mm. And that's what we've missed here, particularly as it is inevitable. And I think, Alicia, you also know about this and can comment on it. The fact is we do look at these campaigns not as Tory Labour but as presidential in the run-up to it and neither of them is particularly exciting and from Keir Starmer's point of view that's a huge advantage because he's given away very little. What is it about Boris and I'm not going to ask you Gitter because you worked with him so much I want to ask somebody else but you did still work with the Conservative government Jonathan what is it about Boris that has that star appeal? Uh, he's chaotic, he's extraordinarily fluent, uh, he can fire from the hip and he understands what makes the newspapers and the news programmes really tick. So he fires and inspires and people are in despair sometimes about what he does. But overall the impact is to say is you cannot miss me and is a noisy no version of Bill Clinton. When Clinton would walk into a room there was charisma. You know, it was almost palpable. You noticed he was there. And again, in a quiet way, I had the privilege of seeing Nelson Mandela at Downing Street. And when he came into the room, there was a presence. It is something that's really difficult to explain. And you've got, with Boris Johnson, that presence. Now, you either hate him or you love him, because there's no two ways about it. But he has it, and it's an incredible gift if you use it properly. And that's a big if. And if he bestows it on somebody who could uh, benefit from it in a campaign. Look, Alicia, uh, let's get back to Nigel Farage, because I know you were there at the rally this afternoon. He was holding a press conference. It's not a rally anymore. He's, get, he's got the seat. Uh, there were protesters. What was it like? Well, well, I mean, it was quite mental, to be honest. It's the only way I can describe it. I heard me shock, word. shock. <laughs> I mean, I think I've spent quite a lot of time with Reform and Nigel Farage during the, the past six weeks. And let me just say that every single thing I've been to has, has had some some kind of crazy thing happen at, at any given point so it wasn't a massive shock that today was chaotic but we were all sitting in there there was lots of reform supporters there and within a few minutes it became clear that there were some protesters who had pretended that they were reform supporters come into the into the press conference and were standing up and, and saying that Nigel Farage was a racist Nigel Farage just said boring move on and then said that they were probably actors planted by another TV channel and um, we obviously don't, don't know the truth behind that one yet but it's just really interesting and it will be interesting to see how long he can bat off this argument. He keeps being accused of having a racist within his party and he keeps saying that he will vet his party better and he'll get rid of anyone with extreme views. But we don't really know what his definition of racism is. How far will he go? Does he have a no-tolerance attitude to this? How, how deep is he willing to go for this? Because it seems to be a problem that keeps arising within his party. So it'll be really interesting to see now that they have four members of parliament, potentially five we're hearing as well. Um, I think there's a recount going on as we speak, apparently. Interesting to see how he deals with that. Gitto, in terms of the way that he deals with criticism, as Alicia was saying there, just denying, deflecting and kind of turning it around, is this the Trumpification of British politics? He certainly is that brand of, of politics and the mistake is for the Conservative Party to have been so distracted by him. And even tonight, I cannot believe that there are people who still think that the problem was that they lost 
votes and seats to, well, there's four, maybe five. And on this side, how many Lib Dems are there? How many Labour MPs are there? 400 plus, you know, 70 or whatever it is. And so the idea that Conservatives conclude that the problem is they're not right wing enough because they've lost four seats out here on the right is deluded. And I think the critical thing for the Conservative Party now, which sadly, despite warnings from better people than me that this is how it would end, they have got to at last wake up, smell the coffee, very strong coffee, and say the only place where elections are won and lost is essentially here in the sweet spot in the middle of British politics and out there on the fringe. You can make a lot of noise, but you're not in power. And for Nigel Farage to today to say with his four seats behind him, you know, Labour, we're coming for you. Wow, 400 Labour seats for, you know, you know delusion. Hello? Just... So just really quickly on that as well, it was interesting earlier today, one of the elected reform MPs stood up and said, Labour have not won a real mandate here. And I looked at them and I was like, <laughs> there are four of you and there are 412 Labour MPs. And they were really, really like genuinely saying that the Labour majority wasn't real because uh, of the vote share that, that, they'd, mm. that they'd collected across the country. But it's just it's quite fascinating mm. to see how such a small body of people have such a loud voice that seems to resonate. Indeed, and uh, I think if uh, one thing struck me is, uh, you know, we've been a bit policy devoid. But if you look at Nigel Farage's policies, they are of the madhouse. They're absolutely barking. Uh, they're not going to have a hope in hell of ever working properly at all. And an 11-year-old with, you know, passing knowledge of economics could tell him that the, your, your prescription will bankrupt the, the entirety of Parliament. And you'll think Liz Truss actually was a beacon of sensible and you know, sensibility and, and reason. Uh, but no one actually just pointed out to them at that point, this is madness. Your madness. Now let's get on to some serious politics here, um, entirely with Alicia and Guto. It's around about the middle, and uh, you know, they're going to be having a lot of fun, I think, in mm. Fleet Street, and you're going to be having a lot of fun <laughs> looking at some of those candidates or looking at some of the people who actually might actually become MPs. I want a Nigel Farage and George Galloway fight, you know, <laughs> cage fight in a ring. <laughs> Galloway's you know, gone in you Dubai. Lost your chance. <laughs> well, you know, you can you can still get in the cage, um, it's sort of, because that's nice. that's where they both are. You know, Nigel is George Galloway unelected until now, and now he's elected and George is not. But it's a similar thing, offering sort of false hope, snake oil salesmen at the fringes, the mad margins of British politics. And uh, Just wrapping things up, let's have a bit of fun. I want you to guess what Sunak is going to do next. Jonathan. Sadly, I think he's going to go back into commerce, and uh, as Gitto and I were talking about it earlier on, he wants to make more money. He's not exactly short of a bob or two. Uh, I would hope it will take six months off and then reconsider and think about something where he can use the knowledge he's gained of you know, top-level world international finance and diplomacy and perhaps do something really useful on a different stage. Interesting. Alicia? I mean, he keeps saying that he is definitely going to stay and remain as a member of parliament for the next five years. I mean, I don't think I'm the only person who's not quite buying that. I think he potentially might move across to the US and go and do something more, more businessy. But what I do hope he does do is get some advice on how to run an effective election campaign in case he ever, he ever finds himself in that situation again. Would anybody Good. let him do it? <laughs> yeah, that's true. Good He's so. already got a flat in Santa Monica, uh, you know, and just comparing the weather that must be very very tempting but on a serious point i think he does get and this is why this i thought he would have been a good choice for the rest of the decade he gets artificial intelligence he gets all these new industries he gets how technology offers uh, hope to drive economic growth and improve public services so for him and i'm told he can code and i'm told he can hold his hold his own with the greatest geeks you know and talk anagrams um, and um, uh, algorithms and stuff so i can see not in finance necessarily but at the financial edge of this great big exciting tech world and um, that's where he belongs and I think he's got a contribution to make and it'll be a good one. Well, there you go, Rishi Sunak. Free careers advice here on Al Arabiya English from our panel in the studio. Let's thank Alicia Fitzgerald, political correspondent Gitto Harry, former Director of Communications to Conservative Prime Minister Boris Johnson and Jonathan Haslam, former Director of Communications to Conservative Prime Minister John Major. Thank you, all three of you. So that wraps things up, our special coverage of the UK general election here on Al Arabiya English. But don't go anywhere. Hit that subscribe button. Plenty more to come from me and the team. Thank you.